Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? I hear you. Okay, um, I will start now. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar hosted by the Malaysian Water Association and Malaysia International Water Convention. Today's topic is financially sustainable approach towards smart metering. Thank you again for joining us. Um, today, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Kanud Bond, Managing Director of Campstrap Asia Pacific Samuel Bahad, and uh, he's joining us from Denmark today. Next, we have Mr. Marcus Chang, Sales and Business Development Manager from Camps Club Asia Pacific Sundram Baha, joining us from Kuala Lumpur. So today, um, there will be two polls running for this webinar, and we would appreciate if you can participate in our polls. So during the webinar, all participants can submit your questions to the speakers during the presentation, and they will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. The question and answer icon is located at the bottom bar of your screen. So if you look at your screen right at the bottom bar, you see the icon Q and A. So just press that icon and you can submit your question. And if you don't miss any part of this webinar, you can still watch it on YouTube. We will post up the link on our Facebook. So you can go to our Malaysia International Water Convention Facebook page. Now, um, now, without further ado, let me introduce to you um, Mr. Kanut Bond, who is the Managing Director of Campstrap Asia Pacific Sangram Bahad, and he will give us an introduction on Campstrap. Um, Mr. Kanut? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all of you. And also a very warm welcome from my side to this webinar. Thank you for taking your time to join in this. My name is Kurt Bonda, and I will take you through this together with my good colleague, uh, Markus Chang. And uh, both of us, uh, all of us from Campstop, are very proud to be in this uh, webinar together with the Valencian Water Association. The topic that uh, we are going to talk about is to give you some insights in the technology and financial impact from smart metering in water. We will do that in uh, two main steps. Uh, at first, I will give you a, a very short uh, 
brief intro to Kampstorp for those of you who do not know us. And after that, I will hand over to Marcos, who will then take you through the more detailed uh, presentation. Now, let me see if I can change here. Marcus, can you hear me? I cannot change the uh, right now. Okay, now it works. So, at CampStop, our purpose, our overall purpose is to ensure clean water and energy to a maximum number of people. That is, of course, not something that we do on our own. That is something that we do in, uh, in conjunction uh, in good cooperation with our prime customers who are the utilities and in this sense, the water utilities. So we work very closely with those. Our ambition is to revolutionize the supply of clean water and energy through intelligence. And by intelligence, we mean use of data. All the data from the meters uh, uh, can be used for many issues, not only for the billing, but also to bring down costs, also to maximize investment, and also to give a better information flow back to the primary customers, the users uh, of the water. And that is uh, a, a basic of what we mean by revolutionizing the supply of clean water and energy in, re in relation to water. We are doing this, uh, this exercise, so to say, these solutions uh, in a number of core business areas. As you see, water is in the middle here. Water is certainly uh, a very important area for us, but as uh, also electricity and cooling slash air condition, also heating, not so relevant uh, in Southeast Asia, but in other parts of the world. So we, uh, we do those four types and we do our metering solution on, on all those four types of consumption. Below you see some pictures of our electronic meters who are all of them really a state of the art technology. Here a brief impression of where we are active. Altogether our solutions are sold and marketed in around 80 countries, out of which we have got our own offices in, uh, in more than 20 countries, among other in Kuala Lumpur, as, as mentioned, as said, and also in the Asia Pacific, in China and India. All the green dots represent our uh, distribution partners, uh, who also is spread out uh, in, a, in around, who is spread out in around 60 countries. So this adds up to some 80 countries. The APAC office uh, was founded uh, last year and uh, is a sign that we want to be much more uh, in, in place in the uh, Asia Pacific area and not the least in the Southeast Asian area. So we hope that uh, you will our appreciate, appreciate us uh, arriving in the marketplace uh, in a more solid uh, form, so to say. Our company is, is based in Denmark and uh, we are very technology-based, innovation-based. Uh, we are around 1,500 colleagues, out of which uh, more than 300 are only focusing to R&D. So we spend some 12 to 13% of our revenue on uh, R&D, uh, which in our term is a, a very high proportion spent on R&D. But this is for us the best uh, security for the future, to have the right solutions uh, coming into the future. This slide just give a very qu quick uh, look on our, our solution, our value chain. If you start in the top, uh, you see the electronic meters and uh, moving to the right, you see our meter reading systems where we have different uh, ways of doing meter reading, uh, drive by an automatic meter reading and also we can work uh, with, uh, uh, with IoT solutions. We do the meter da data management and we use all the meter data for analytics. As I briefly mentioned, we call it water intelligence uh, when we speak of water. We can also uh, do the hosting and uh, number of services and the project management. Of course, the customer can always choose. 
So this was, in fact, uh, my very quick and brief uh, introduction to uh, to Campstop, and I will now pass on the the stage, so to say, for you, Marcus. Uh, please, and thank you. Yes, thanks, Kanut. Um, so my name is Marcus Chang. I'm a business development manager for Chemstrup here in Asia Pacific. And coming back, uh, th th thanks Knut for the introduction and coming back to the topic that we are going to cover today is how a smart meter pays for itself. I'm sure everybody here attending is trying to look for an answer specifically on this topic. So without further ado, let me jump right in. First of all, in order for us to uh, have a meter pay for itself, we need to measure its benefits. Now, what I've done is I broke it into two. First, the intangible benefits, benefits that we all hear all the time, um, that smart meters are remote reading meters. It is, uh, you get more accurate data, you increase your data resolution, meaning you have hourly data now instead of monthly data. You can use the data for hydraulic modeling and a lot more benefits that you have already heard before. But for a beater to pay for itself, we really need to look at the tangible benefits, benefits that you can measure and you can justify. Put pen on paper, come up with a business plan and show how it pays for itself. So, on tangible benefits, there's two things. There's billing revenue increase and reduce of workforce. We has, have heard uh, some discussions of how remote reading meters can reduce number of meter readers, but at the same time, we know that the cost involved uh, simply doesn't justify. So I really want to bring your focus on billing revenue increase. Now, even when we look specifically on the topic of billing revenue increase, there's still two parts to it. One is the not measurable billing revenue increase, which is elimination of uh, estimate reads and prevention of meter tampering. So question is, if we know both of these can happen, but how many uh, meter tampering is occurring in your network, for example. Marcus, are you know. showing your slides now, Marcus? Yes, we I can't, am. Sorry. Oh, we can't see your slides. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I was about to tell you. <laughs> oh, no. I might need to fall back then. Sorry. Oh, okay. We have it now. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to jump back here a bit, yeah? Um, measurement of benefits. So the intangible benefit I mentioned earlier, you heard it. Um, this is what I was intending to show you. The list of all those benefits that we have seen before. And then the tangible benefits. Yeah, billing revenue increase, reduce of workforce. So here is where we really want to get your focus on, billing revenue increase. So when we talk about billing revenue increase, we have the non-measurable part, elimination of estimate reads, prevention of meter tampering. And then the measurable part, things that we can actually measure and, and put on paper, you know. So if we have a stuck meter, for example, replacement of stuck meter, a meter that has zero bill, we look down the history of your billing records, we can kind of tell how much revenue we expect by replacing that meter. So that's relatively easy to calculate and it is important to do. But what is more challenging is when do we replace badly deteriorated meters? Because when you go up to, to a meter and it's running, how do you know how badly deteriorated that meter is? It's running, you turn on the tap, it is running. Then of course you have resizing of meters uh, if it's the wrong size, but here, I want to bring your attention on replacement of badly deteriorated meters first, because that kind of answers the rest, replacement of stuck meters and resizing. So in order to, to, to really explore this topic of replacement of badly deteriorated meters, we really need to look at, uh, answer ourselves how meters deteriorate. 
we need to find that out. And one of the ways, uh, one of the tips I, we can give you today before we, we go out to the field and get some real data from, from your network is to look at some research that was done. So here's a research paper coming from Castellon, Spain. They did a research on aging of single jet meters and kind of give you the representation of single jet, multi-jet meters as well. And in this research, what they have done is this. This is the summary, yeah, what they have done. They took a sample of 201 consumers and they went on to sample their distribution flow rates. The, the basically, the consumption behavior of this customer. How much water do they consume at high flow? How much water they consume at low flow? You know, how often you take showers and how often uh, you wash a plate or a cup, you know, something like that. And then they look at new meters. So this particular utility that they have uh, explored, they took their new meters, they tested it on a test bench, 3,700 units of them to find out what is the efficiency of those new meters at different flow rates. And they also took a sample of 1,200 old meters. Literally, they took it out from the field. Yeah, they took it out from consumers, replaced them with a the new meter. They took the old meter back and they tested it. So they tested various age of meters and various mileage of meters. And what they have done is they have come up with a weighted error for both the use and the old meters to come up with a degradation model, which we will look at is quite interesting. So before we start, uh, back to the flow distribution, yeah? Here is the consumer behavior that they found. This is data from their research. I just clean up the data and make it more presentable. I just clean up the graph, sorry, and make it more presentable. Um, this makes up 100% of the consumer's water consumption. What it is simply telling you is that, for example, 72.7% .7 of the consumption happens at a flow rate of 2,000, uh, sorry, 250 to 1,000 liter per hour. That is where the bulk of their consumption occurs. And then you can see they have some very low flows and some even higher flows. It could be two, three showers happening at the same time, you know, at the very high flows. Now, um, coming, this is the consumer, all right? It has a big impact on how the meter efficiency works as well, which I will show you afterwards. So we understand how meter degrades, yeah? This is a meter degradation with age. You can see that the different colors represents the different age of the meter. So zero years is new, new brand new meter, and um, the color goes on. So if you look at uh, why is there two graph here, it's because the researchers also done a sample on two different brands. They simply name it brand M1 and brand M2, that's all. It doesn't mean anything else. Uh, but before we go further, I really want to get your attention on the first line, yeah? The meter at gear zero, that blue line up there. This is a brand new meter. So for those who are not uh, experienced in meter curve, maybe I'll do a short explanation for you. Why does it have that negative at the 15 liter per hour, yeah? negative eight, and then it jumps up to positive, uh, let's say four or 5% at 30 liters per hour. It's because on this slide, I'm showing you that a new mechanical meter will always look like this, that red line over there. Uh, most mechanical meter has this behavior. It has a very steep jump from a highly negative number all the way to a slightly positive and it, it comes back to a 0% error. And what this is, is Q1. Q1 at 30 liter per hour. This is actual data from the researcher, by the way. And then Q2 is at 120 liters per hour. Any manufacturer of meters are legally obliged to have their meters fall within plus minus 5% error between Q1 and Q2 at that low flow. So the regulation accepts higher error at lower flow, okay, 
and then Q3 and Q4. Basically, at the higher flow, Q2 to Q4, the regulation allow only allows you to have plus minus 2% error. So hence, you have a curve that looks like this. So um, what does Q3 then plays a role? You know, how, how does Q3 comes into the picture? The nominal flow Q3 divided by the minimum flow 30 liters per hour Q1 is your R number or uh, what the correct term would be your dynamic range of that meter, 50. So this is R50 meter. So we, are, we have also heard of other things, for example, um, R800 meter, meters that can measure much lower flows, right? So simply means that, that Q1, the Q3 will remain the same, but Q1 will now be 1.875, for example. Much lower flow at a low range. So I can measure those little drops of water. Uh, but something to consider here is that now that you understand how a meter curve would work, now we come back to this graph. You see how fast that degradation occurs on a meter. All other years except for year zero, immediately that low flow end of that meter drops significantly. So regardless of what ratio meters that you are using, R50, R400, R800, 1000, on a mechanical meter, this is what is going to happen. Yeah, that degradation over there at the low flow. It hits the low flow harder. So if you took out an old meter and you test it at high flows, you would have the perception that the meter is working just fine. What you should have done is you should take an old meter, test it at all the flows, the low flow, the, the nominal flow, and also the high flow, the max flow. Then you get a clear picture like this, what is happening. On this other slide, it's the same set of meters, M1 and M2 brand meters, same group. But the difference now is we are looking at mileage. So the colors now represents the mileage of the meter. How many meter cube that the meter have seen, okay? It could be sitting there for 10 years, but it can have a low mileage, like maybe only a thousand meter cube might have passed through that meters over 10 years. Or it can be a year old meter with 10,000 meter cube passing through, okay? But now we have seen a better correlation that meters degrades more with the mileage. Yeah, there's a much better, if you look at the colors, there's a much better correlation. The higher the mileage, the more it degrades. And again, same thing, especially on the low flow end of the meter. It degrades worse for mechanical meters. Now, if you take the two data of consumer and meter, you put it together, this is what you will see. The consumer above, yeah, the, the, the bar chart above, and the line graph below is the meter, the consumer above. From here, you can see, for example, for the case of Castellon, Spain, the consumers there, they have 72% of water consumed at the high flows. So even as the meter degrades, as you see down at the bottom where, where the meter curve is, even as they degrade, the chunk, the big chunk of their consumption is not as badly impacted at the higher flows. So um, does it mean that they don't need to replace? Not really. Because if you combine the consumption chart together with the meter degradation curve, if you combine those two, H to H, mileage to mileage, okay, um, this is what you get. So Oh, as the mileage increase for meter brand M2, for example, at 4,000 meter cube, you're looking at negative 15% error. This simply means that every 100 meter cube that you send to this particular customer, uh, installed with this particular meter, you will only see 85 cubic meters in the build. 15 cubic meters will be lost. And then brand M1, for example, has a better situation with only negative 10%. It could be a better uh, design meter, more suitable, or it could be that those meters are installed at a location where water quality tends to be better in that area. It's hard to say. 
So now that we look at how meter degrades, okay, the next question is what happens when the meter is replaced? So I take that example of meter brand M2 from that research, and now I'm putting in my numbers, okay? These are all assumptions from now on, but though these are valid assumptions you will see. If I install a new meter, I've decided that 4,000 meter cube is my cutoff point. Okay, we need to really sit down and do some calculations, some financial calculations, why 4,000? But let's assume 4,000 first at this point, okay? What will happen is you are going to renew that curve. And this is how it's gonna look like. That point right there will be transferred here and you're gonna start that degradation of the mechanical meter all over again. So everything below this curve is your savings. That red color area right there would be your savings. And then at some point you are looking at another replacement, 4,000 cubic meters later. So if you continue on, the next replacement would show you the next savings, which is pretty much the same thing and you come back to a new meter replacement. So this is how it would look like and what savings you're going to expect from replacing a degraded meter. First, we need to know which meter has been degraded. It has been degraded to a point where we need to replace and then we replace. We need to calculate what kind of savings we expected from it. And then we also need to do some future budgeting as well. How many times you're gonna replace this meter over the next 10 years? Because that 4,000 meter cube for this particular customer could happen every two years. So that means that this meter can be replaced every two years, but uh, we need to financially justify it. And it becomes difficult because the savings is so small. You, here we are looking at three meter replacement already. And if it was to be a smart meter with uh, communication built in and so on, um, that cost, that would simply drive the meter cost up yeah, a smart mechanical meter, it will simply drive the meter cost up and doesn't add much. The savings that you see is the same. Right? The tangible savings that you see is still the same. So before, uh, this is what I want to cover on the normal savings that you will see from replacing a meter, a mechanical meter with another mechanical meter. Um, before I go further, actually, my next point is to cover on how to enhance these savings. All right. However, I need you to be on your seats because I will be looking at a few more numbers and tables and graphs to justify the next point. So let's take a quick poll. OK, we're going to take a one minute time to do a quick poll of three questions here. So feel free. Okay, so I shall continue. Now, before I go ahead and do that justification, um, before I go ahead and do that justification on how uh, to enhance that savings, um, you might already have a few questions because that research paper we have brought up is a research paper from Spain. But we have different type of consumers, different behaviors, different type of meters that we apply here in this region. So I have personally thought of that as well, and I've done a little bit of research into it. So for example, water quality. What if we consider the water quality that we experience here? Um, the only thing I can say over there based on, based on my findings is 95% of Spain have drinking water 
quality standards. So they do supply drinking water from the tap in Spain, although not everybody use it for drinking, but it does meet that quality. Um, and not all parts of our regions meet that same quality. So um, maybe you can say that the water quality is either same or better for Spain. So we might experience something similar or worse on our side in terms of meter degradation. So the worse the water quality, the quicker the meter will degrade yeah, due to stuck meters and so on. And on the next question here is, what is the impact of household tank? Because we use household tank. And the numbers you see um, coming back to this graph, 250 to 1,000 liter per hour flow rate. These are pretty high flow rates. Either the consumer does not have a household tank as a direct supply, or they have very good pressure, or, or both, you know, one or the other. But let's say, let's make an assumption now that if we use household tank and the water flow rates are lower, is indeed lower, and that we move the chart a little bit to the left, now you can see it is being impacted by meter degradation even more. We are not sitting on that part of the curve where meter doesn't degrade much. We are sitting on now more on the part where meter degrades heavily. Yeah. So that is something that we need to consider as well. And then another question would be the difference in metering technology. Volumetric piston meters is what we typically use here. Uh, although parts of uh, many parts of Indonesia use the multi-jets and Philippines as well, Malaysia, we use a lot of piston meters. Um, so what's the difference there? Uh, just a quick one. I'm not going to jump into too much graph or table here. This is another research, a very quick one slider I'm going to show you. They study the aging of volumetric piston meters in Kampala, Uganda. So same similar process. They took a bunch of meters. They look at consumer behaviors. And what they found is this. Submetering reduces submetering for them because uh, these meters are installed on individual apartments. Uh, reduces the utility revenue water in Kampala by 18% due to individual aging of the meter and low network pressure. Further than that, they also look at uh, and concluded that about 25% of water use occurred at flow rates of 0 to 35 liters per hour. And this is a huge difference with what we saw in Castellon. Castellon, you're looking at 75% at 250 to 1,000. Here, we are looking at the quarter of the consumption is all happening at 0 to 35, a lot of low flow. And the researchers there concluded that it's due to the valve effect of private elevated storage tanks that magnifies the, the under metering of water. And then they also concluded that volumetric positive displacement piston type meters are not suitable for Kampala due to the observed high failure frequency. And this is the data that they have obtained. Um, most of the meter, as you can see here on the bar chart, most of it is due to stuck piston and gears. Yeah, these are piston meters that got stuck due to water quality issues. In general, this is what they are trying to conclude. And now, coming back, how can we further exploit these savings? If replacing one mechanical meter with another is not all the answer that we can justify a smart meter, how then can we do it? Yeah, how can a smart meter be financially viable? Now let's look at how it can possibly be done. Right now, we are looking at 5% savings for each meter replacement throughout its life. For this particular case, yeah? It is for this particular consumer and this particular meter. Now, what if we put in a meter that is non-deteriorating to achieve two things? The first thing we want to achieve is to have the, if the accuracy of the meter increase closer to 0%, I want to build almost all the water that I sell. Then I want this meter, second part of a non-deteriorating meter is, I want this meter to be accurate throughout the lifetime of the meter. 
regardless of how many cubic meters is has run through it. I want it to be accurate. And from those, from this meter, I also want savings throughout the lifetime of a typical meter. So I don't do this other two meter replacement. I put in one meter and I want to see that savings. And in this case, if we can achieve that, it is a 15% savings yeah, throughout the lifetime of that meter. So in comparison, we are looking at one non-deteriorating meter has 15% revenues uh, increase versus three mechanical meters at 5% billing revenue increase. And this is all for this customer and this meter. We need to do research and we can assist you in doing that research uh, to find out uh, for your application, what can that number be? So is there such a technology? Does such a technology even exist to achieve that? The answer is yes. There are static meters that we can use. See, ultrasonic application from DN15 to DN100, you know, this is the bulk of the billing meters. And this is where ultrasonic technology is the most efficient and most uh, economical uh, among static meters. And we typically use electromagnetic meter application for the higher sizes of meters. And if you look at a graph to graph comparison, this, as I showed you earlier, the red line mechanical water meter, the black line here is an ultrasonic water meter. That is the difference because ultrasonic doesn't require kinetic energy from water to push the turbine to spin it. So it doesn't have that up and down curve as a mechanical meter. It also does not suffer the same wear and tear. So you can see at year zero, both are new. At year two, it will look like this, yeah? At year three, it will look probably something like that. Yeah, it, it's that trend I'm saying. I'm not saying that that curve is the exact curve that we get, but that is the trend. And how do we know? How do we know that ultrasonic meter stays like that over the years? First, let's look at how an ultrasonic technology works, okay? I'm gonna show you a quick video on how it works. So you see an ultrasonic meter measures water using ultrasound. It measures two ultrasound signals and determines the time difference between them to measure the flow rate. And we know that this meter stays accurate over the years is because of our own experience. You see, we have plenty, we have millions of installation in Europe. And you know, in Europe, one of the main requirement uh, there uh, not in all countries, but in quite a few of them, is to have the meters removed from the field, put on a accredited test bench to be tested, and it has to perform whatever R number that you have determined for it when it was new. So if it's an R50 meter, it needs to pass the R50 test. If it's an R800, then it must pass the R800 test. So we have our meters we have a credited lab within our factory. We took out one, in, in this particular case, yeah, we took out 1,308 meters, about six to seven years old. That's around the time where they need to be retested and re-verified. 96% of those meters fall under plus minus 2% error. Meaning, meaning to say, after six or seven years, these ultrasonic meters remain as new. Plus minus 2% error is even beyond the accuracy of what the low flow for a mechanical meter uh, is required to do. We do above that with an ultrasonic meter. 
3.7% fall under plus minus 4, and only 0.3% fall out of spec after those number of years. And it's not badly out of spec, it's just beyond 4%. So now this is, this is the idea, this is the approach, and it can be done. Um, if, you just, if you just scribble down a number now, if I have a consumer of 100 ringgit yeah, in Malaysia, 100 ringgit per month consumption, and how many of those consumers do I have? If I can save 15% on consumption and that, plus savings on those future replacement of meters, and if I want an ROI of two years, can that be achieved? You know? Um, we can actually put pen on paper and find out how many meters can be really replaced. We need to do a bit of research on how consumers behave, um, test a few old meters to see how degradation works with the various brands of meters that is installed. And we got an answer over there. Because now in these challenging times, if we want to survive only on intangible benefits, it's very hard for funding to come by, I presume. So now that we have tangible benefits, we can then harness all the intangible benefit that comes with it. Yeah, we can finance it either through internal budgets. We could work with um, investors, you know, or government funding, whatever it takes. Now we can justify a a how to pay for that meter, how the program can really pay for itself um, with science. Now we are looking at other intangible benefits. For example, um, some of our meters are actually uh, acoustic meters as well, uh, ultrasound meters, ultrasonic meters. So the sensors also listen to audible sound, that hissing sound of a leakage in the meter, in the pipe, sorry. And here you can see two cases where our customer uh, has a high audible sound you see that 150 decibel, and here we get 100 decibel from the meter. This is data coming from the meter. Decibels is like a noise logger. And they repair the leakage, and the noise came down. So these are, I, I can't tell where the leakage are until you install the meter. And at the same time, you can't justify installing the meter until you know how many leakage you can repair. So it's a, it's a never ending chicken or egg question if you go that direction. But now you can harness those benefits. Here's another case of leakage that is, uh, in this case, it is simulated leakage at the blue dot right there. And basically, they simulated a leakage here, and that's where the peak of the noise is, the acoustic sound is, 400 decibels. And all the neighboring houses also have some indication of leakage. So there's a little bit of correlation happening over there. Other than that, of course, smart meters comes with uh, ability to be read remotely. So you can do drive-by, walk-by. You can have uh, high-rise uh, uh, AMI communication. You can have a 4G bridge to reach to the rural areas. You can have a, a tower, a cell tower to read up to 2,000 meters, up to 2 kilometers in distance. You know, all that now become possible. And when we do all this, definitely we would like to have data analytics done. So to further enhance the value of smart meters, we want to analyze the districts, uh, the, water dis the, the different DMA, DMZ. Um, we want to look at the data that is coming from acoustic sound from the meter, for example. And we want to record incidents you know, that is uh, captured by smart meters, for example, uh, if a meter is dry, it knows that the meter was dry. Although a uh, tempering error didn't come up, it could indicate that it's dry. We want to find out if the other meters are dry or if it's just this meter was dry and we really want to find out what happened at that location. Um, meter tempering errors, you know, things like that, we can start to analyze on. But um, to keep things short and sweet, um, I'm going to end my presentation here. However, I just want to end it by saying from our side that uh, this is our contact information. If you have any questions on how to determine when to replace meters and how to do this justification, this financial justification, the business case, um, you can always reach out to us as well.
But before that, we also have Q&A. Um, so we will try to answer some of this Q&A. Uh, Denise, uh, do I hand this back over to you now? Um, you can see the Q&A. Uh, okay. Q &A, and then you can answer the question. No There's problem. one. One question. Okay. Um, there's a, a question on whether this electromagnetic wave can harm people, uh, meaning it's coming from the meter. Yeah. Uh, first of all, these are not electromagnetic meters. It is not EM meters. Uh, these are the, the, the meters that, that is suitable for residential, uh, small commercial and small industrial application, which the bulk of the meter where, where uh, static technology can be applied is ultrasonic. Yeah, it is more it is more of a ultrasonic technology because it is more financially viable to do it that way. Electromagnetic meters at the very small sizes are too costly. Any other question? There's one more. Yeah. So there's one more question um, regards to low tariff, low water tariff. And that's a very good point. Um, you see, having low water tariff is where we started at the beginning. We, we look at cost of smart meters and we say that I can't achieve that with this such low tariff. And that is true, that's generally true. But what we are saying is out of that, let's say 500,000 connections that you have, um, Low tariff is one thing, high consumption is another. Um, a customer can be consuming a lot of water. And if you continue to use a meter that is, let's say, example I used earlier uh, from that research, negative 15% efficiency. And this customer pays, uh, let's say 100 ringgit, just 100 ringgit a month. And you can save 15 ringgit a month. You take that over 12 months, and then let's say over three years. That's enough money to pay for a smart meter or close to paying for a smart meter. So it really depends on what duration of ROI that we want to achieve first. So we need to sit down, we need to look at that. Second, we need to look at how your meter really deteriorates and how your, your consumer consumes water. Because from the papers that I showed earlier, it seems that it kind of gives us that feeling that our de the, the impact of degradation is higher on us than in Spain because our consumption is more on the low flow side. So there is justification, but just not everyone. With low tariff, we just can't do it for everyone, but we can nip and pick which one. There is still a possibility for us to do smart metering and yet have it pay for itself. So this, this we just need to do more work than others to achieve that. That, that is where we are getting to. Um, Yes, the next question is again the same thing. But it mentions eight here that. Now. Yeah, eight question. <laughs> it mentions here that financial sustainability is not touched on. It, it, is, it is touched on. Um, we are giving you the guidance on how to get there. Because note, every consumer is different. What if you have one consumer? I give you an example. You have one consumer that really pays 100 ringgit every month. Okay, we start there. But backtrack a little bit. This consumer consumes water at zero to 25 liter per hour for whatever reason, okay? For that whole 100 ringgit bill. And you have an old mechanical meter installed on this guy. And that justifies uh, moving on with a different technology. That is a smart meter. You know, that 100 ringgit a month of savings you're talking about, uh, completely not red. Let's say, let's say this is a worst case example. So what I'm saying is we need to do a bit of research on it. We can't categorize a whole network of that it is not viable or the whole network is viable. Um, it would be nice if we have like uh, for, the, for the industry, you know, if we have higher tariff, um, then it's easy to justify. We don't have to do too much work. But the difference now is we, we don't have those tariffs. 
And we need to scavenge whatever we can to make that justification. So the answer is we need to do more work. So from what I have touched on just now, I didn't give exact number for any single utility to pay for itself because what we have touched on is the process of getting there. It is possible out of the 500,000 connections, maybe 10,000 is viable, right? But who is that 10,000? Maybe it was 15, maybe it's 20,000, I don't know. We need to sit down and do this together. It is very possible when we apply a non-degrading meter to justify that replacement. But the key is we need to use uh, something that is non-degrading. A uh, question on how long does the battery last? Uh, for a typical ultrasonic meter, if you want to, uh, uh, to put in such a technology, you better have it last more than 15 years, one five, 15 years. Um, because you want to really maximize your, your investment. But then again, we need to sit down. 15 years is one thing. We need to sit down and look at what ROI is acceptable. Maybe for you, it might be just five years. You know, I will only look as far as five years. So which customer can I install such a technology? And who are those customers? We need to research on it. Who are those customers to get my money back? Uh, what potentially, what would potentially cause the degradation of an ultrasonic meter? Um, you see, ultrasonic meter is very uh, capable in, in sustaining its efficiency on the field uh, as a technology. But then you might have seen many different ultrasonic meters in your profession. There is a difference in, in the quality and the technology when it is built. Uh, ultrasonic meter A, B, C, and D is not all the same. So you really need to look into how it is built, um, the quality that it is built. But as a technology, it is actually very, very um, uh, able to, to sustain a high efficiency. For example, if you have bio growth within the meter, let's say, because it is a straight through meter, right? Um, and, and things will flow right through. Um, so, you don't have this clogging issue so much. You can put a very big strainer at the back of the meter and as long as the big chunky stuff don't come down, it's fine. But even if you have bio growth within that meter, remember we have two ultrasound signal coming in each direction. So even if biofilm would have slowed down the sound, it cannot block the sound. We know that for a fact. It slows both of them down at the same time. The difference in time travel between the two signals remains the same. And that's why it remains accurate for so long. Um, can we understand the ability of thermal energy meters for district cooling level? Uh, yes, we can talk about thermal energy meters. In fact, uh, we do carry out different webinars for that. It is probably not covered with uh, MWA and MIWC because this is purely a water session. But for energy meters, uh, there is another discussion on that as well. Um, by the way, Knud, uh, Adrian, if you, if you would like to jump in in any of these questions, feel, please feel free. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to continue and, and run through it. Uh, how many okay, Mark, let's, let's continue yeah. and run through. I'm writing a few additional remarks to some of the answers uh, in, in the text okay. box. Okay, sure. I think it's better you. you just continue uh, for the time being. Okay, thank you. Um, how many countries in ASEAN have these smart meters, I guess, have these smart meters been installed? Um, right now, we have done some tests in Brunei, uh, for example. Um, but we also have projects elsewhere, which we could discuss individually. Um, but we have several countries where we are running tests on these meters already. Uh, we, as a brand, as a camp group, as a brand, we are fairly new in APEC because we have put a lot of focus in Europe prior. 
Uh, we are very successful. In fact, we are the first to develop a meter that can listen to leakage that costs about the same as any most any smart meters. So it is a pretty amazing development, but that's that's what we do. We focus a lot of time in Europe and now we are here in APEC. Um, does your meter support IoT SCADA? IoT is a topic that we are already looking into. Um, but as you know, uh, IoT itself is not uh, mature yet. So we can't say that we can put a meter at the ends of our country or our region, you know, and still expect to have connectivity. So we don't have that yet. And in fact, at the moment, we don't really encourage that yet. We are developing it. We will have it, but not yet. Where? I'm not clear about this question. Um, where for digital water meters use up to 4,000 cubic meters, such as manual? Uh, I guess and what consumers? Huh? Um, if you have a house converted to a restaurant, um, if you have a, a restaurant lit out, right, you know, a, a laundry shop, a laundry shop, uh, things like that, you know, and even a very big house that has a lot of occupants. I don't know, but we can find that. We need to just look down the billing data and we found we can find that. Not 4,000 meter cube in a year, by the way. Uh, it could be 4,000 cubic meters in two years, three years. It depends on that consumer. There is some uh, calculation that we need to do together. Look at the billing system. Look at what type of meters that you're using, the consumer behavior, and then we can determine. Uh, what should water department do to check the age and efficiency of the meter? Uh, good question. I've seen many approach to it. I've even seen many tests in our region where they only test it at single flow, one flow. So we, the, the best way to, to check a meter efficiency is first test the meter at all flow. So at Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, at least. If it would be nice if you can find some of those samples and test it at 10 flow, you know, between Q1 and Q2, between Q2 and Q3, and so on. So you really know how the meter behaves. But how efficient is that meter to read a uh, consumer's water consumption? Also depend on how the the consumer consume water, right? If the consumer consume water all on the low flow, then we should just test it all on the low flow. You know, no point testing on the high flow because nobody is using water there, example only. So this is how we should look at it. We should test it on the flow range where the consumer is using water. And if we don't know, we should test the entire range of that meter. Sediment deposit, will it affect accuracy of ultrasonic meter? Um, and as I answered earlier, the answer is not much effect. Let's assume that sediment deposits on one side of the meter more than the other side. And as I mentioned earlier, the ultrasound wave comes from both directions. So it slows down, it's, it will slow it down. It will not block the ultrasonic sound. Ultrasonic sound has very deep penetration. In fact, we use it for medical purpose to look inside our bodies. So it has very deep penetration, but it will slow the sound down if it goes through some solid, yeah, some kind of solid, biofilm, deposits, whatever. But because we have two sounds, not one, it, as long as it slows both sound down the same amount, the both of the sound wave goes through the same sediment, then we are fine because the total time difference between the two is still the same. We are still measuring flow accurately with sediment. Is your smart meter measuring the volume of water used for historical flow rate data so that leakage can be detected from consumer households? 
uh, the, I guess the, to summarize that question is whether historical data is captured, number one, and whether we can detect leakage from the consumer's uh, end. The answer is yes to both. Um, hourly data is captured within that meter. And many smart meters, and not, not just our meter or whichever brand, I'm talking about smart meter in general, data is captured within that meter. So you can have your hourly data and so on. Plus to, re to capture and detect leakage within a consumer household is quite simple. It's very easy. The strategy is, is there a point of zero consumption for that consumer in the last, let's say seven days, okay? I, the meter will just continue to look at seven days data and say, uh, is there any zero consumption or is there always some water flowing? Always with no zero consumption for the household. Then it knows, it will sound an alarm. You say, hey, I have never seen a zero consumption for this house for the past seven days. So it sounds an alarm and it says leakage. Uh, that is easy, actually. The, 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 the other part that some, like for example, what Chemstrup has done is the meter now also listens to leakage back to the main pipe. So where you install the meter, if there's a leakage down to, let's say the tapping point of the main pipe and beyond, um, we can hear that acoustic sound, the, the typical hissing sound of a uh, leaking pipe. So both ways can be done. Uh, for, for factory meter, you know, like a meter that is installed in a factory, uh, you want to get a one year return of investment. What is the minimum consumption per, per day for, of water that is suitable to use smart meter? Uh, that's a very good question. In fact, for meters that is installed for industrial and commercial use, it is the, one of the easiest to justify. Uh, what is the exact minimum consumption? We need to sit down and work it out. Actually, we, we do have some expertise on our side as well. Uh, if you if you reach out to us, we are more than happy to help you look at those information and determine what kind of ROI um, you should expect from replacing your meters for, for which customer, for example. So maybe looking at the type of meter that you have installed today, number one, looking at how the consumer consumes water, um, it might be difficult to, to get but at least we can also do a test on some of those older meters and see how they de deteriorate. Yeah, and make an estimate how the consumer would consume water typically and what flow rates. Um, if, we can, if we can get a feel, just a feel of that, then we can at least put pen and paper and come up with an ROI for replacement. So what is the minimum? It depends on how that degradation works for that meter and that consumer as well. So we we can we are more than happy to help you find out that information if you if you had if you have such a, a issue that you want to tackle. So please reach out to us on that. What happens if plastic bags pass through your smart meter? Uh, the, uh, plastic bag in a in a water pipe is hopefully it is not it does not happen too often. Um, I'm. But again, anything can happen in this world. We know that. However, our smart meters do come with at least a strainer. But the difference is the strainers that you see in ultrasonic meters are much bigger. So it does capture plastic bags at least, you know. And, and anything that is smaller than that strainer will simply flow like right through because there's no moving parts, you know. There's, uh, most stuff will just flow right through. Uh, but you should at least have a, a strainer on that meter, even, even for ultrasonic meters, at least on the smaller sizes between DN15 up to DN40, you should at least put a strainer. And anything bigger than that, whatever that fits in that pipe is going to flow through. Uh, okay. Most of our water meters are over five years of age, but NRW is only 3%. Do you re recommend replacing our water meters? Hey, the thing is, if we look at the 3% overall NRW, 
Um, that is perfect. In fact, that is very well managed uh, NRW levels. But then again, you are looking at it as a whole, you know, as, as a whole network in average. Um, if we now look at where the 3% is, can, is there an opportunity to find that half a percent just by, just by um, changing the technology of metering for those consumers? Is there an opportunity to do that? It simply means that your work to get from 3% to 2% is tougher. You have a harder time to try and find that half percent or 1%. But it doesn't mean that you do replace or you don't replace. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that, that kind of decision making. Uh, just by looking at 3%, I don't replace. Or looking at 3%, I do replace. But just simply understand that your effort to get that half or 1% is simply tougher. We need to look at more data um, to really find that half or 1% where we can fix. So if if we if you can spend that effort, if you are continuously vigilant in in keeping the NRW low at three percent and try to bring it lower, I think that's the the best way moving forward. Is is not uh, generalize whether I make a decision or not based on three percent. How does the meter listen to leak noises? Does it work with installed meter to correlate the noise location? Um, at this moment, we don't correlate the noise yet. And the way it works is simple. Uh, ultrasonic sound uh, meter, uh, as the name implies, ultrasound. Yeah, it, it has transducers to shoot out ultrasonic sound wave and listens to ultrasonic sound wave. Uh, what we have done is simply make a meter with the same transducer. We don't add anything too much to it to make it to make the same transducer also listen to audible sound. It's a very smart uh, thing to do because now at almost the same cost, not too too much different. Now you have a meter that is measuring very accurately, doesn't deteriorate, and listens to leakage all at the same time. And even if as of as I speak right now, um, even if if anybody comes up to us here in, in APEC to buy a, a, a leak detection meter, this ultrasonic meter that listens to leakage, um, our production is all backed up. The whole Europe now is asking for this meter and our production is simply backed up for, for months and it works, you know. So if you're interested, please reach out to us and we will be happy to talk more about that. Uh, By system, what are the criteria based to determine? Uh, the next question is very general. It talks about uh, how ultrasonic meter can be applicable in our region and what criteria. Well, the the earlier presentation I gave uh, really covers uh, a lot of those aspects. Um, generally, we need something that is more capable of sustaining high turbidity water that doesn't degrade, um, something that lasts long on the field, something that doesn't look expensive, that someone wants to steal it with something sticking out from it. You know, we don't want anything like that in our region. Um, we need a battery life that lasts long because we can't afford to continue to replace a uh, 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 smart meter uh, too often. So these are the criteria that we need, all the all the human aspect to, to the meter. but. Other than that, we, we have to really dive deeper to look at what your scenario is. In the past, Kelantan did install some form of smart meters which fail. What is the difference with your smart meters now? Very good question. Um, I'm not sure what, what was installed there. I have no idea and I'm not going to touch in history. Um, I did hear it was some ultrasonic meters. But then again, how many years back was that? There's a question. Um, we now have meters installed in very challenging situations. A little bit of air bubbles here and there, a little bit of turbidity here and there did not, did not at all impact the efficiency of our meters. 
uh, it can be installed with a direct elbow coming in and out. It doesn't require a straight line. It doesn't require a flow straightener and anything like that. So it, I think time have changed quite a bit on technology. Um, we cannot look back 10 years ago and say 10 years later, we don't, we don't look at it again, ever again. Um, kind of like how we look at smartphones and cars and things like that. The te technology has changed quite a bit. Uh, 10 years ago and now. I'm not sure how many years back was that. I'm pretty sure it's quite some number of years. But um, to, 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 to make a judgment on that, I think somebody really needs to put it on the field and, and test it or uh, go have a look at some of the applications that has been installed to, to really get a feel of how good it will work. Maybe I can add a few comments here, yes. Marcus. Uh, yes. In, in, in general, from camps of site, we are these days we are our production level is about one million uh, one one million uh, water meters ultrasonic water meters per year, and and uh, basically we go by every customer. If a customer would come back to us and say something is failing, then we would look into this and find out what is wrong, because we are convinced that the meter can work uh, in almost all conditions and. Uh, also to the other question, if, if ultrasonic meters are applicable, yes, they are basically applicable uh, everywhere. Uh, and, and we do in fact see very few customers coming back to us with and telling us that, hey, you failed. And if mm -hmm. something like that happens, then we would certainly attend it and find out what is the reason why. And now that I, I, have, the, I have the word, so to say, one more comment on, on, the, uh, on the financial issues. There has been many qu good questions about that. Mm -hmm. We would really call upon uh, our, our potential customers when, when comparing a technology, do look at cost of, uh, cost of ownership in the lifetime of, of, the, of the metering solution, not just the, in the installation moment. Look at the total cost over 15 years. Look at the, what what service costs do you have? How often do you have to exchange the meter? How many uh, calls do you have to go out and, and fix something? And also look at the revenue because a better meter will give you more revenue because more uh, all the consumption is measured. A poorer meter would only measure part of the delivered water. And then you also only get paid for parts of the delivered water. So please, dear ladies and gentlemen, when you compare technologies, uh, this goes in general, look at the cost of ownership over the, say, 15 years, and not just in the initial investment moment, because the full picture uh, you only get when you look at the full period, holistically. Just a comment on, on, uh, on the return on, on investment issues. That is certainly important. Yep. Thank yep. you. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, and SPAN approval, and this is the metrology approval for Malaysia. Uh, we'll have it in, in due time. It's already in the process and we know we'll have it in due time. Um, can it be customized? Uh, question. Uh, depends on what customization means. Uh, if, it's, if it means uh, having name printed below, beneath the glass, uh, yes, you know, you can have utility names and all that. Uh, that kind of customization. They are plug-ons for, for protection, you know, casing, things like that. Uh, customization like that, yes. Um, disconnection for non-paying consumers. Uh, is it possible to be done remotely? A good question, and I have seen this question quite a few times myself. Uh, we there is there are solution and yes, Chemstrup also have such solution where the same equipment that you use to read your smart meter is the equipment that you use to shut off the valve. Uh, there is a valve that you install behind the meter. So as you drive by, if the billing department determines that this meter should be shut off, the the moment the meter reader drives by, it shuts the valve off. Uh, can be done, uh, but bear in mind that. This kind of application, we, we also it adds it adds to the cost, so we need to look at the ROI as well. Uh, if that is a concern, however, if it's an application where ROI is not a concern, it's a special application, 
then definitely yes, it, it is there is options for that. I would like to mention an, an example here. Uh, mm -hmm. We are for the moment delivering uh, around 200,000 meters. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, we are for the moment delivering around 200,000 meters to the city of Antwerp in, in Belgium. And all of those 200,000 meters are attached to a valve in order to uh, be able to do this uh, exercise here to disconnect non paying customers. Uh, so that that's the purpose of, uh, of uh, one of the purposes of this project. So it, as Mark has explained, it it can be done. Yeah. Right. And um, coming to this next question of, uh, let's say the question says, supplied area is subjected to a lot of pipe bursts, yeah, frequent water supply interruption. Uh, what will happen to the accuracy of that smart meter? Uh, in in our experience so far, like uh, pipe bursts, what happened? What what do you mean by pipe burst, right? Uh, maybe the impact from a pipe burst is that when you do repairs or you shut down the water and the water comes back on, it creates a lot of turbidity in the water. So question should be like, can the the meter handle those kind of turbidity? The answer is pretty much yes, because we have seen we have seen uh, high turbidity applications of our water meter in places where, where turbidity is an issue. On top of that, uh, something to bear in mind. Our meters actually, for, uh, in our case, yeah, I'm not applying to all ultrasonic meter in general. This is from our experience, what we are sharing. Um, when, you, when you have a uh, ultrasonic meter that is run on a heating situation, so in Denmark, we have a lot of our ultrasonic meters is used for measuring uh, heat, uh, basically measuring energy, how hot water is applied to heat up the house, how, what is the temperature and volume of the water going in and what's the temperature coming out, you know, something like that. This application has very high turbidity in the pipelines. Hot water pipelines has very high turbidity. And there's no issues in reading that so far. I, I did see in some previous uh, application of ultrasonic meters where turbidity is an issue. I have seen that some meters actually have that problem, a uh, big problem in that, in that situation as well. Um, we are not to say a zero impact, but from, our, from what we have seen, the only way to justify it, let's put one at those locations and we we'll see, you know, that's the best way to answer that question. Because right now, all we can tell you is from our experience, it should not impact it too much. But again, ultrasonic meters do not measure air. So if you have a disconnection of, uh, di uh, disconnection of supply, yeah, supply interruption, and then a lot of air is built up in the pipe, and then you push air out, those air, those air are not going to be measured until it stabilizes. Yeah, a little bit of bubble is fine, but if it's all air, the meter is simply not going to read anything. So in fact, if you measure a scenario, just that scenario, uh, mechanical meters might measure more because it measured the air, uh, which we don't. Okay, uh, there's, a, there's a point that was raised, Kalantan was using EMF meters. Thanks for the input, yeah. It wasn't ultrasonic, okay. Um, ultrasonic might be subjected to lightning surge spikes. You foresee this an issue in Malaysia, uh, like damage from lightning. Uh, I think that is something that can be considered. It, it, it is from, uh, I had this question came to me before as well, to be frank. I, we did raise it with the factory, but we have not yet seen, it, it might have occurred on the field, you know, and the customer simply just replaced that one meter, right? Um, we are not seeing tons of meters coming back from the field and, oh, lightning strike, lightning strike, lightning strike. We, we have not seen that yet, at least on our side. So there may be an assumption we would make right now. This is without real data, we are all making assumption. Maybe an assumption we can safely make right now is that the lightning strike on meters is not something that is extremely common. I wouldn't say it's not possible. Um, but 
I don't see it as being extremely frequent enough. So we don't see tons of meter coming back all getting lightning strike and lightning strike. You know, we don't we don't see that. If I may add a comment here, I've yes. I've been uh, in with CampStop for 29 years, and when I look over the years, okay. yes, from time to time we see meters who have been hit by lightning here and there. Okay. But, okay. but it's not it's not a big problem since the meters are, are typically in basements and are other protected places. So I, I'm, I never heard it to be a big problem. But that again, it does not exclude that it may happen from time to time. Okay. Thank you. Does your measure, does your meter measure in half full? Um, okay, that's this. The answer is no, okay? To be, to be clear and straightforward, does your meter measure half full? Answer is no. Uh, but also take note of one thing. When a pipe is half full, it simply means that there's no pressure. There, there should be no flow, or there should be trickling amount of flow uh, due to gravity. Uh, this is this is what we all learn in Manning's equation, Hazen Williams equation, right? You don't you don't apply a half full pipe equation on a full pipe. When a pipe is half full, there's no pressure, and it doesn't flow. So air either air is flowing through or sitting half full or uh, it's just flowing by gravity in one direction or another. Uh, so straight up answer no, half full meters can't be read by ultrasonic meters, but then again, a uh, uh, more serious consideration is uh, it won't stay half full for long if there is pressure. Uh, specific customization, such as temperature, turbidity measurements, added onto ultrasonic. Okay, temperature, yes. Um, good point. Uh, now, now I understand your question earlier. Uh, customization on whether the meter can read other things, right? So temperature, we do measure. We do measure noise, for example, on some range of our meter. We do uh, turbidity, we do not measure on our ultrasonic meters. Um, and I, for now, uh, at least for the near future, I don't think we have plans to add turbidity as one of those measurements onto our meters. At least for the short term, we don't have that plan yet. But we are looking very, very much into turbidity uh, in our R&D. What does this mean for us? Mm. Is it yeah. relevant for us? So we, the topic is uh, certainly uh, uh, on, our, on our dashboard, so to say. So uh, we we are uh, our R and D colleagues are, are researching in this. Yeah. But as Marcus said, and nothing nothing specific in the meters for the moment. Okay. Yeah. And and I understand where that question comes from as well because for for some utilities now they are started to switch over to more focus on water quality rather than NRW. Um, then turbidity comes into play. Uh, who if I repair a pipe. Who, who are the people who are getting all this stability, you know? Um, maybe there's something, some way I can control my valves to try and let things settle down before the water is let through. Uh, I, we, understand, we understand where that question is coming from. But not yet, not at this point. We can't do the stability yet. Is the meter having any value from vandalism or teeth uh, from drug addicts as happened to mechanical meters? Ah, that is, that is a good point. In fact, um, maybe if, if I have something on my computer that I can share with you, um, no, I don't have it here. But it really depends on the design of that meter. And very good question, actually. If you have a water meter that looks like a spaceship, it's going to get stolen, you know? And that, that, is, that is the end. So no matter how we dive deep into, into technology and what it can do, uh, but the human factor, if it's not taken care of, uh, then the, the whole idea falls apart 
is a good point. And that this is the area where we have put a lot of emphasis on. Uh, we emphasize on making meters, at least on our part, maybe there are others as well, but we emphasize on making meters that looks like a normal meter. When you walk up to a meter, you look at it, it doesn't look anything special. It doesn't look like it has a battery inside. It doesn't look like you have a radio communication devices inside, nothing sticking out, no antenna, no nothing. And, and this is proven because we have in, an installation uh, here in APEC, we have a few, and in very, very uh, security-wise challenging location, security-wise, uh, if you know what I mean. And those meters are still there. It has been out there for a long time, and I can say it's still there, you know. So if you were to reach out to me in person, uh, we we can we can contact with our uh, our users, and we gladly have you some pictures or photo or some kind of information. You can have a look. You know, it really uh, boils down to the human factor as well. So good question. The answer is so far we have passed that that test. And maybe this has also got to do with the uh, with the. Uh, that we do not use metal uh, in the, the meter, the, uh, in, in yeah. the shape of yeah. stealing. It's, it's no, you cannot make money out of stealing a meter and then selling, the, selling it as metal because it, it's a composite material, a very strong uh, composed composite material, but you cannot turn it into cash by, by going to someone and selling it uh, as, yeah. as material yeah. as you can with a metal meter. Yeah. So in fact, uh, in, in, in the way of stealing meters uh, to, to sell them, to, to make a little money, uh, we, we don't hear very much of that because uh, the thief will not know how to turn our meter into money. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kano. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I think yeah. we have uh, come to the end of this webinar. Okay. Uh, will our admin pull up the second poll, the second set of poll questions. Can we invite participants to answer these uh, three very short questions and we will show you the results. While answering, I would like to put a remark and say thank you very much to uh, all of you out there Thank you for listening in and thank you for all the good questions. We hope to meet you again at, at some occasion uh, here or there. And uh, feel free to reach out for us, as Mark has mentioned. We'd be very happy to uh, discuss further with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Kalu. And now, uh, a big thank you to the Malaysian Water Association for hosting today's webinar. Um, unfortunately, Dato Kade, President of Malaysian Water Association, is not able to join us today. So on behalf of Dato Kade and the Malaysian Water Association, we would like to thank you. We have scheduled the next webinar for 19th of May, which is next Tuesday at 3 o'clock same time. So do join us at the, at the next presentation. Asylum Incorporated. For all the details, you can follow us on our Facebook, Malaysia International Water Convention Facebook page for updates and also the link to our YouTube channel so you can watch this video again. So if you have any other questions or feedback, uh, participants, you can still um, put it onto the webinar chat on the right panel. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Kano. Thank you to all yep. our participants. So let's stay home, stay safe and stay motivated. So until next week, next Tuesday, we see you, we see everybody again. Thank you very much yep. and thank you. Bye. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you too. Thank you.